about five years ago I moved to a new town for work and have been here ever since. In my hometown, I'd been a bit of a barfly, so I found myself looking for a new place to drink within a week of moving in. Not even a mile away I discovered this quiet little Irish style pub. On a cold Saturday afternoon, I went to check things out. I pulled up to the bar and ordered a beer. My bartender spoke in a fine Irish accent and recommended that I try a real Irish pint. I took his advice and found the beer to be the best I'd ever had. Six pints later, I staggered back to my apartment confident I'd found my new home away from home. Before long, I was spending every week and night there, drinking away my troubles. The bartenders soon all knew my favorite drinks and had them poured for me as I took my seat. The lack of a jukebox or any music system was definitely my favorite part of the joint. They could get a little loud on the days they showed the soccer games, but even then it barely grew rowdy. It was overall a nice calm place where you could relax and shoot the breeze with a few fellow drunks. I truly loved it. As I got to know folks at work, I made a few friends. One guy, who everyone called Bert, turned out to be a really cool dude. I told him about the pub and he wanted to join me that Friday after we got off of work. At the end of the week, he followed me there and we had an awesome night. Soon enough, Bert was patronizing the place almost as much as myself. He was the type of guy everyone loved and most of the regulars took to him instantly. Everyone but Spencer, that is. Spencer had been coming to the pub almost as long as it had been open. Since he was so well known, he had a bad case of gatekeeping. Anyone who hadn't been around as long as him was never good enough. When he'd get loaded, he was even worse. Most of the time, people would back down and he'd walk away all puffed up. He must have thought that he was tough and no one would dare stand up to him. He hadn't met Bert yet. You see, Bert was the nicest guy you could ever meet. He'd give you the shirt off his back if you needed it. However, if anyone dared take advantage of his kindness, they were in for a blistering butt-chewing. I'd only seen him do it once, and when he was done, his target was in tears. I'd been watching Spencer for a while and knew it was only a matter of time before he tried this on Bert. Deep down, I think Spencer was jealous because everyone liked Bert. Spencer, on the other hand, had very few friends. When that night finally arrived, it took a turn I could have never imagined. It was a Saturday, just after 10 p.m. Bert had attended a wedding and didn't arrive until then. When he walked in, the whole place yelled, Bert, like they always did to Norm on cheers. He gave his usual collective wave to everyone and sat on the stool next to me. His beer was waiting when he sat down. He said hi to me and thanked the bartender for his drink basically the same routine he'd been going through for the past four months. The two of us soon became involved in a discussion about football with a few of the other regulars. Out of the corner of my eye, I could see Spencer prancing his way over to us. The sneer on his face said it all. Bert was speaking to the bartender at the time, and Spencer interrupted them by jamming his glass in the bartender's face, demanding another beer. The bartender was obviously used to this by now. He grabbed a fresh glass, filled it, and handed it to Spencer. Once this was done, he went back to their discussion. Spencer didn't like this for some reason. He walked over to Bert and claimed he was being rude. Bert said he was sorry and returned to his conversation. Spencer should have stopped there, but he didn't. He interjected himself again and called Bert a smug a-hole. I could tell this hurt Bert's feelings. A frown appeared on his face and his eyes were filled with dejection. Then, in a flash, they narrowed and a snarl grew on his lips. I knew what was about to happen. I put my head down and braced for impact. You no good. And for the next minute, Bert commenced the most verbal assault I'd ever witness. By the time he'd finished, his usual happy expression had returned. I don't think Spencer knew what hit him. His mouth sat agape for a few seconds, but the vindictive sneer he normally had soon returned. I don't know who you think you are, but no one talks to me like that and gets away with it. Spit flew from his mouth as he said it, and it was clear Bert's thrashing had hit home. 
We waited for him to try something, but instead, he turned around and stomped away back to his table. We couldn't help but laugh. Standing at five foot five, slightly overweight and balding, he was far from intimidating. The storm quickly blew over and we all returned to our conversation. Around 30 minutes passed and Bert got up to take a leak. At the time, I think I was watching G.I. Joe on a nearby TV. A few minutes later, Bert returned but said nothing. He tried to sit in his stool but couldn't make it. I made some wisecrack about being a lightweight and chuckled. He attempted sitting again but still couldn't. I also noticed he wasn't speaking. <laughs> What's up with you, dude? Are you stoned or something? The reply I expected never came. I began looking at him closer. I noticed blood on his head and the stool. I grabbed and turned him sideways. He winced and I began looking for a wound. His dark shirt made it hard to see, but I soon found it with my hands. Blood was coming from his stomach somewhere. When I raised his shirt, I could finally see the injury clearly. It appeared that he had been stabbed. Despite not being large, I could only assume there was a lot of internal damage. I yelled out for someone to call the ambulance. No one reacted at first, but once I had laid Bert onto the floor, a couple of guys nearby whipped out their phones and dialed. I kept asking him who had done it, but he couldn't do any more than make noises. The ambulance arrived in a rapid manner and rushed Bert to the hospital. Now, with him gone, the police had one very important question. Who stabbed him? Since Bert wasn't talking, we couldn't say. He asked if Bert had any enemies. We couldn't help but laugh. Everyone who knew him loved him. Except Spencer, of course. The possibility didn't seem, well, possible. They wanted to speak to him regardless. We led him to the back, but he was nowhere around. I checked the bathroom, but Spencer wasn't there. I did discover a small pool of what looked like blood next to one of the urinals and a bit more in the sink. When we finally did find one of Spencer's friends, he said that he had slipped out the back door about 30 minutes earlier. There was little doubt left in anyone's mind now. That little weasel tried to kill my friend. I was livid, but the fear I felt for Bert's life overruled everything. I wanted to drive to the hospital that second, but I'd been drinking, so I had to wait for a cab. Bert was in surgery when I arrived. Every second I had to wait was like an eternity. When the door finally emerged, I had no idea what to expect. Your friend didn't make it through surgery. I'm sorry. That's all she said before walking away. I was confused at first. Did they mean his recovery would be long? What did she mean? Gradually the words began to make sense and a sick feeling welled up in my stomach. A few of the other regulars arrived soon after and we were all in a state of shock. At least an hour passed until I remembered Spencer was responsible, and my anger returned. With no hope of survival left, all I had was fury. I wanted to track him down and kill him with my own hands. If the others weren't with me, I may have done just that. They did a great job of reminding me nothing I did would bring Bert back to life. I would only manage to ruin my own if I went through with my plan. Around dawn, we all went our separate ways. This is when the grieving would truly begin. The environment around work was very somber. As you can imagine, Bert was well liked. Him not being there left a big hole. It got so bad our boss shut down for a week. I'm glad he did though. I was free to celebrate Spencer's death without being judged. I never found any joy in someone losing their life until that day and it couldn't have happened to a better person. That morning's paper said that the cops had tracked him to a hotel, but he shot himself before they could arrest him. Bert's funeral was two days later, and I'm happy to say it was packed to the rafters. You would have thought he was one of those old-time mob guys. By the time we loaded him onto the hearse, that place was standing room only. The crowd waiting for us at the cemetery was even bigger. I shed a tear or two when I saw it. I'm proud to have known a man who touched that many people 
and I can only hope to have 10% of that many at my funeral. As the ceremony wrapped up, several of the group invited me to join them at the pub. I hadn't been there since the night Bert died, but I declined. I've always been a social drinker. The idea of bellying up to the bar without Bert sitting on the stool next to me just didn't seem right. I haven't set foot in there since. It's been a few years and I don't drink much anymore. Maybe a beer with my meal on occasion, but that's about it. You'd never guess the money I've saved, not to mention I've lost at least 30 pounds and feel worlds better than I used to. If I'm being honest though, the hole left from Bert's death had never been filled. No matter how much I work out and how much money I save, I feel like something's missing. Between you and me, I'd give it all away in a second if I could have my best friend back. Rest in peace, man. Keep the stool next to you in heaven open. We got a lot to catch up on. I've been meaning to share this story for a while now, but we've been busy making the move to our new home. With all the unrest going on, we decided to get away. Our new place is deep in the rural south, far away from any large cities where violence could break out. I included this bit of information because it makes a great segue to what I'll be talking about. I'll not beat around the bush any longer and get to my story. At the time, my husband and I had only been together a few years. We made the choice to get settled before beginning a family. We were living in a big northern city. One no different than any other in the early 2000s. Crime was on the decline, especially the violent type, but we still had areas known to be a little rough. The two of us had been on the lookout for a small neighborhood bar to buy. Nothing we found had appealed to us until we came across this little dive in one of those rough neighborhoods that I had mentioned. It had all we wanted except for a high crime rate. We hadn't noticed the police station across the street before the owner pointed it out, and we were sold after that. I mean, no one's going to cause trouble with cops just across the street. Never mind that a large amount of the clientele were cops. What could go wrong, right? The sale went through with no problems. We soon became the proud owners of a prospering business. Despite never having owned a bar before, we were handling it pretty well. My husband had the idea to turn the storage room into a little kitchen for small things like burgers and sandwiches. Within two weeks, our income had almost doubled. We were even able to hire a part-time cook. Things were only getting better. Then the shooting started. At around 1 a.m. one night, a regular of ours, a police detective, was leaving the barn headed for his car parked across the street. As he crossed, an unknown car sped past him and opened fire. He was unfortunately killed instantly. There were no witnesses to the murder. As you can imagine, his fellow officers were furious. They were going over his case with a fine-tooth comb, looking for any reason to explain the attack. A few months passed and no real leads had been found. Everyone hoped that it would be an isolated incident, most of all, us. We didn't want the bar to get a reputation for being dangerous. And just when it was starting to look like it may never be solved, two more officers were attacked. Another pair of detectives just yards away from our door were cut down in a drive-by. It was a miracle no one else was hit. Thankfully, neither officer was severely injured. They were both able to make quick recoveries and give their counterparts enough information to find the shooters. I say shooters because it turned out to be a pair of brothers. They had targeted these officers specifically. All three had been part of the case that put their father in prison. He had been convicted on first-degree murder after the death of a co-worker and given life without parole. Despite stacks of evidence against him, he maintained that he was innocent. His sons stood by him all through the trial. They had hoped the judge would consider his lack of priors to be lenient on him. Instead, she threw the book at him. The brothers tried to stay positive, but as the years passed, they became bitter and desired revenge. They would wisely do what their father refused to do and accepted a plea deal. Not only would they avoid the death penalty, 
but both would have the chance of parole after 30 years. Such a decision was not popular among the city's law enforcement, but the public outrage would eventually die down and life would return to normal. Although we were almost sure our business had been destroyed, once the facts of the case came out in the press, we were able to recoup most of our lost income. There was a period there where we began discussing our options. Being so close to those incidents made us fear our neighbors and question if we wanted our kids to be exposed to such violence. After things bounced back, the discussion got put on the back burner but never truly went away. We managed to survive the crisis of 08 and 09 and make a good living for ourselves. In 2016, we had our first child and we were looking forward to a bright future. All of this went sideways when the pandemic began and unrest broke out everywhere. Then, a neighborhood less than a mile from the bar was burned down last month. The discussions of 2005 were revived and, in short order, we chose to sell the bar and just get out of Dodge. Here in our new home, life is much slower, people are far kinder, and all this confusion seems to be a world away. I pray for the sake of my son and the child that I'm currently carrying that things stay that way. This was late 1995. I just turned 22 and was working at a bar, this sort of biker dive bar. While it wasn't known as an especially rough place, it was by no means a place for weekend warriors. Anytime one of those guys came in, the regulars would laugh in his face. I'm certainly no tough guy. I've never even owned a motorcycle. I hadn't known what I was getting myself into when I got the job. My first night, I was terrified. Almost every guy that walked in looked mean. I was afraid I was going to be beat up, but they turned out to be really nice people. At least most of them. While not all of our customers would have been considered one percenters, most were. I figured I could benefit from learning all I could about the lifestyle. I'd stand behind the bar and watch members of differing clubs, some who had been at war in the past, talking and joking amongst each other. I was expecting a battle to break out at any second, but it didn't. It's true the occasional fight would happen, but the other guys always insisted the angry parties take their problems outside. I asked the owner how the bar managed to be so peaceful. He told me a story about how he'd opened the bar in between two rival clubs' turfs. He'd come from another area and wasn't aware of the problem that may occur by putting it there. Soon, guys from both clubs began coming in. There was a fight almost every night. He was afraid that he was going to have to shut the bar down, and this must have gotten back to both clubs. These guys liked the place so much they got together and decided it would become neutral ground. Over time, other clubs started coming in and they agreed to the terms too. The owner said he didn't find out about the agreement until much later, but he was happy it had happened. Anyone with any sense knows violence is bad for business. There had been no war since the agreement was made and he believed it was because of the bar. I had no idea if it was true, but I was relieved to hear that no one would be murdering me during one of my shifts. I had been tending bar there almost two years. Money was good and I had no plans on leaving anytime soon. I'd even managed to make a few friends. One night, I'm not sure of the day, some regulars from one of the bigger clubs were drinking and playing pool like usual. Three guys from another club were playing on the next table over. One guy bumped into another while he was taking a shot. I'm sure all these guys were tight by then and emotions were a little heightened. Some words were exchanged, but clear heads prevailed and the guy's friends talked him down. Just to be sure, I watched both groups. I could tell the guy who had been bumped was still mad. He was sitting on a stool giving the other guy the death stare. When they finished their game, the group with the bumped guy left. I was finally able to relax and get back to work. It couldn't have been more than ten minutes. I had my back turned, pouring a beer for a customer. I heard the door open and looked over my shoulder. The bump guy had returned, and something about his body language wasn't right. I gave the customer his beer and thanked him. 
I continued to watch the guy. He took a few steps and yelled some cuss words at the guy who'd ran into him. I don't even think the dude realized the guy was talking to him. He kept playing pool, unaware of what was about to happen. Even before the words left his mouth, the bumped guy pulled a pistol from under his jacket. He began firing at his adversary, striking him with his second and third shot. After eliminating his primary target, he began shooting at the man's friends. Two other members of the club were struck down in a matter of seconds. I finally wised up and crouched behind the bar. Four guys remained. They had taken shelter behind a dividing wall and one of the men began returning fire. What had begun as a nightmare had now morphed into a full-blown hellscape. Bullets were flying everywhere and customers were running for their lives. All of a sudden, in the midst of this cacophony, I heard a loud boom, then another. I peeped just above the bar and saw the owner holding a shotgun. He fired a third shot at the assailant, hitting him across the left shoulder. The man's arm was left dangling, barely connected to his body. This didn't stop him, though. He turned in the owner's direction and raised his pistol. Before he could get a shot off, my boss fired again. This time, he struck him square in the chest, killing him instantly. I sheepishly stood up and surveyed the damage. The racking of a slide grabbed my attention. I looked over and saw my boss holding a spent shell, smoke still pouring out of the barrel. He calmly looked at me and told me to call 911. I did so and stayed on with the operator until the police and paramedics arrived. While we waited, the victims were assessed, and my boss announced that the cops were on their way. Several of the customers, including the guy who had been shooting back at the assailant, left out the side door. I could only assume they were felons and had stuff on them they shouldn't have. The original target was dead and his two friends were badly injured. My boss walked behind the bar and put the shotgun on a shelf. I was amazed at how calm he had been. I looked at his hands. They were as still as a surgeon's. Meanwhile, I was shaking so badly I could barely hold on to the phone. He returned to the two injured men and helped a female customer try to stop the bleeding. The paramedics showed up a couple of minutes later and took over. Soon after, the victims were loaded into two ambulances and taken away. The cops were now crawling all over the place, questioning everyone they could. When it came my turn, I opted for... I didn't see nothing. All I admitted to witnessing was the killing of the original target. I claimed to be hiding behind the bar after that, which wasn't a complete lie. I had been around these guys long enough to know not to incriminate anyone. At least, you'd be labeled a snitch. At worst, you'd end up disappearing forever. As for my boss, he told the cops his part in the shootout and nothing else. They got angry because he wouldn't name the other guy, but he told the truth, at least mostly. He had been in his office when the shooting began. As far as he knew, there was only one shooter and he was lying dead a few feet behind them. The police were finally forced to give up. Everyone present knew the rules. All the evidence supported self-defense, so no charges were filed against my boss. He was kind of livid as shotgun became evidence, but I'm sure he had more where that came from. I wish I could say things cooled down and life went back to normal, but things only got worse. The shooting sparked off another gang war that lasted over ten years in my area. Although the two men injured that night did go on to make a complete recovery, they would end up dead. Just two lives among an additional seven lost in the course of a senseless war. The conflict caused business to suffer greatly. We fought on another six months, but it was no use. My boss gave me an envelope with $5,000 and wished me luck. Such a large amount of severance made me think that I wasn't hearing the whole story. One talk in particular came to mind. One late night after close, we were having a beer and sharing stories. The discussion came around to his life before the bar. He was living in a big city out west at the time. Most of his friends were outlaw bikers, but he himself lived a square, straight-laced life. He drove with guys from several different clubs and no one cared. Then, a war broke out and three of his friends got killed. He began to feel pressure to pick sides, so he picked up and moved here. 
While I don't think he was friends with anyone involved in the current conflict, I think it stirred up some feelings he wanted to stay buried. The drop in business was likely just a convenient excuse. I don't blame him though. If I had lost friends in a gang war, moved away to start a new life, only to be flung back into the middle of another, I'd probably want to escape it all myself. And that's just what he did. Once the five grand was gone, I had to begin the job search all over. I rang him up one morning just to make sure I could use him as a reference. It had only been about a month since we last talked. Unfortunately, his phone had been disconnected. I took a quick trip by his house, but a rent sign was in the yard and all of his stuff was gone. I was a little disappointed he didn't say goodbye, but I understood. His life had been turned upside down on multiple occasions, not to mention he had killed someone. You see, that's the best thing about being an American. When your life falls apart, no one can stop you from starting over somewhere else. Wherever he may be today, I wish him luck and I hope he's finally found refuge from all the chaos of the world. Unlike most of my friends, I grew up in the business area of my city. My parents owned a little grocery store in the heart of what was once a predominantly Irish neighborhood. Our actual home was directly above the store. I would spend many a summer night sitting on the roof watching the stars with my dad. One of those evenings was the first time we smelled the odor. It wasn't out of the ordinary to catch the scent of something rank in a city especially in our neighborhood with all the empty businesses and houses scattered throughout the area. A cat or a dog would occasionally slip off into one of them to die, and normally we just toughed it out until the smell dissipated. The summer was abnormally hot and made any little odor worse than usual. Not a soul knew the source. Judging by the direction it was coming from, I assumed it was probably O'Malley's, O'Mal's, as everyone called it, was an old bar that had shut down years before I was born. When I was much younger, me and a few of the other boys in the neighborhood used to slip in through the back and look around. Nothing much was left and soon I lost interest in the place. I brought this up with my dad and he agreed with my theory. A few days later, he called the city to report the smell. They said that they would check it out as soon as possible. Weeks passed and the hotter it got the worse the stink grew. Everybody was complaining about it now, but the city continued to do nothing. Things got so bad people stopped going outside. This naturally affected business and my dad getting concerned. The whole mess came to a head one night when a fire mysteriously broke out at O'Mouse. The building wasn't much more than matchsticks and was almost consumed by the time the fire department showed up. Several of the firemen came running out to vomit from the stench. The flames only made the smell more terrible. Once the fire was put out, the reason for the stink became clear. In the back storeroom, the firefighters discovered the bodies of five people. The fire hadn't managed to burn the bodies very badly, but because of the extent of decomposition, no one was able to determine the gender of the victims. Shock soon gave way to a violent indignation. The neighbors wanted answers, but the city had none to give. Ultimately, another six months would pass before anyone got what they wanted. A story would appear on the local news that would blow the roof off City Hall. The problems our neighborhood had been experiencing had come to light, and several people responsible for handling citizen complaints were found to have been ignoring them all for more than ten years. If this wasn't bad enough... Law enforcement had information that a local gang had been taking their enemies into O'Mouse and executing them for quite some time and chose not to act upon it. I'm sure you can guess what came next. The citizens wanted blood. And not just the people in our neighborhood. After an immense amount of pressure, most of those named in the story lost their jobs. A few of those higher up in the bureaucracy were suspended for a time, but once all of that anger died down they were allowed to return to their posts unscathed. Once the populace had their pound of flesh and the awful stench no longer menaced their senses, life returned to normal. What was left of O'Mouse was 
knocked down and hauled away. As part of our new citywide improvement initiative, code for appeasement of the mob, it and several other abandoned or disused buildings were destroyed and made into things such as community gardens and playgrounds. O'Mal's was replaced with a set of basketball courts and all was well in the world again. Unfortunately, none of this did anything to stop the crime infesting our neighborhood. The year I moved away, two kids were shot on those very same basketball courts. No matter what they put in its place, I fear the ground where O'Mal's once stood has become a gruesome beacon to those seasoned in the shedding of innocent blood. After 10 years and multiple deployments throughout the world, I finally decided my time as a soldier was over. I'd been injured more than enough. I was done with all the excitement and just wanted a quiet place to live out my days. For the time being, I was single. I didn't have some female nagging me about her dream house or the best place to raise kids. My options were wide open, or so I thought. I had no idea how hard it would be to find a small place in a quiet little neighborhood. Over six months and countless numbers of calls and hours of driving around, I thought I'd finally found it. I spoke to the owner and she agreed to show me around the apartment. It was a thousand square foot, single floor apartment tucked away near a wooded area. We met up and after talking numbers and filling out papers, we were nearly done. Then out of the blue, it all went south. While looking over the paperwork, she noticed I'd been in the army. She brought it up and I answered truthfully, never expecting there to be a problem. We never should have been over there in the first place. I bet you killed civilians and don't even feel bad about it. I won't rent my place to any baby killers. You can forget it. I didn't know what to say. For a second, I thought I'd gone back in time to the 60s. She sounded like a hippie ranting about Vietnam. My dad had told me a few stories about how they were treated when they came back, but I had no idea there were still folks like that, though. There was little I could say about it. Arguing with a kook was like a waste of time. I thanked her and resumed my search. Another month passed and I was starting to regret my decision. It didn't matter where I lived at that point, I just wanted a roof over my head that was in my name and I wanted it now. I took the place and moved in right away. It actually wasn't bad. The neighbors seemed nice and I didn't hear any gunshots at night. The only negative was a big one. The back of my house shared an alley with a bar. Perhaps if there had been a tall privacy fence between us, I wouldn't have been concerned, but there wasn't. I could see that the back of the building and the patrons could walk right onto my property. Luckily, I only had this problem twice. The first time I noticed movement in my backyard. When I went to check it out, I found some drunk guy peeing in my bushes. I asked him to leave and he apologized. That ended with no problems. The second time would be far different. Despite being a fairly popular place, the bar wasn't very noisy. Besides the occasional screeching tires, I had no complaints. One cool spring evening, I had the windows open enjoying the nice crisp breeze. I was kicked back in my recliner watching a movie when I began hearing a woman scream. It got louder and louder until I began hearing banging on the back door. I peeked out and saw a woman yelling her head off and pounding on my door. I wasn't sure what to do. I knew that this was sometimes a ploy to get you to open the door so you can be robbed. Something told me this lady wasn't acting. Just in case, I grabbed my gun belt and put it on. I slowly opened the door and scanned the yard for any hidden attackers. Once I was satisfied, I stepped out from the house and tried to calm her down. She begged me to help her. At first, I couldn't figure out from who, but soon enough, I got my answer. A tall skinny guy in an oversized t-shirt and saggy pants came jogging up to us. He didn't say anything but, I'm sorry, and reached for the girl. I instinctively rested my hand on my gun and told him to stop. Ma'am, do you want to go with this gentleman, or do you want me to call the police? She didn't say anything, but I could tell by her eyes she was terrified. This guy tried to convince me that she was drunk. He grabbed her again and tried to escape. 
He only got a couple of steps before I caught up. I yanked his arm and he lost his grip. The lady broke free and fled back toward my house. I told her to wait inside while I spoke to the boyfriend. He didn't seem very interested in talking though. He began walking back toward the house but I stepped in front of him and told him to calm down and go home. I couldn't see any marks on his face so I assumed that they just got into a heated argument and she panicked. I was doing all I could to defuse the situation but he just wouldn't listen. Things got worse when he told me to mind my own business and swung at me. I dodged the punch and grabbed his arm. I spun him around and tried to pin it behind his back. He must have had some training because he knew how to avoid it. He got loose and lunged for me. Before he got too close, I cracked him on the chin. He stumbled and fell. I thought he was done, but instead, he sprang at me. I avoided him just barely. As he landed, I saw the glint of something in his hand. I wasn't positive it was a knife until later, but I wasn't taking any chances. The fight had taken on a whole new level of seriousness, and I wanted it to end immediately. Before he could regain his footing, I punched him again and again. He was a tough fellow and didn't go down until the fourth or fifth hit. He was on his back panting, but he still wasn't done. He'd raise his right hand, so I'd smack him again. As long as he had that knife, I knew I was in danger. I started to get mad and lost control, punching him over and over. I don't even know if he was moving anymore. I continued hitting him until the woman ran up and begged me to stop. She was crying, and I snapped back into reality and stopped. My hands were bloody and hurt like a mother. Even after that, he still had that blade in his hand. For all our safety, I pried it out and threw it into the bushes. He did look pretty beat up though. I figured I'd better call 911 before he did die on me. Seeing the very same woman I'd just tried to help ride away with the man she'd been running from will stick with me forever. I'll never understand why women act the way they do. The cops were surprisingly understanding considering the situation. The guy already had a history of knocking women around so... They didn't think I'd face any charges. Nonetheless, I was on pins and needles for nearly six months waiting to see what would happen. I finally got the call that I was okay. To say I was relieved would be an understatement. A sadly humorous little postscript to this story popped up that summer. I was flipping through the paper one morning and a picture on the weddings page caught my eye. The couple looked familiar. After a little reading, I knew why. The happy couple turned out to be none other than the two that I had the run-in with the year before. I wish I could say I was surprised, but seeing the way she acted that night, nothing would shock me. Oh well, I wish them good luck. Hopefully they won't be able to find me in my new place. I moved out into the middle of nowhere to get away from people like them. Whenever they do get drunk and fight again, I can only hope that they find another idiot to bother. This guy has had enough. The series of events told in this story occurred during my senior year of college. Until my junior year, my schooling had been completely covered by a scholarship. Work was not a real priority before then. However, as my third year approached, I finally began taking the search for employment more seriously. I got lucky and was hired on as a bartender at a well-known drinking spot. Despite the pay being good and the tips fantastic, my limited hours made getting by very hard. Nonetheless, I loved the job and looked forward to every shift. My boss was barely older than me and pretty cool. She served as a good role model to me. Her success in business inspired me to begin my own just out of college. Not long after I was hired, she began having ladies' night twice a week. It became popular and the bar quickly earned a reputation as a safe place for women to let their hair down. We did have the rare instance of guys getting too forceful, but the bouncers never let things get out of hand. I bring this up because of the events that took place my final year of school. The night in question was an average Friday. I've been working my tail off since I arrived at 7. Finally, I got a few minutes to myself at around 10.30 and took a break. 
I grabbed any full bags of trash I could find and headed out to the side door. Doug, who was one of the line cooks, followed me. He lit a cigarette and stood just outside the door. We began talking about work, I think, and I walked toward the dumpster. Both bags were really heavy, so I had to throw them in one by one. I could hear some shuffling on the other side of the dumpster. Since I figured it was rats, I didn't dare take a look. When I threw the first bag in, the container moved slightly. The shuffling noise stopped, which made sense. The idea of rats running around a mere ten feet away gave me the willies. I wanted to get away as fast as I could, so I quickly grabbed the second bag and heaved it in. I turned to walk away and heard a whining sound behind me. It was quickly followed by a shushing. This obviously wasn't rats. I had no reason to be afraid. I was more curious than anything. When I walked around to the other side, I saw someone I assumed to be a man getting up and doing up his trousers. I looked at him and said, What are you doing over here? I was genuinely confused for a moment. He glanced down real fast and then back at me. He had a terrified expression. I hadn't seen anything on the ground when he got up, but when I glanced back down, I saw a small humanoid shape laying still on a big piece of cardboard. I started to panic. I thought he'd killed someone. The thing with his pants didn't quite compute yet. He knew I'd seen it and gave me this menacing stare. Out of nowhere, Doug starts asking me what I'm doing. The guy looks over towards Doug, then back at me. I could tell he was weighing his options. Lucky for me, he decided to run off down the alley. He reached the street and slipped off into the darkness. I let out a sigh and remembered the body on the ground. I crouched down to check the person's pulse. When I got close, I could see it was a woman. Her face was all kinds of busted up and bloody. I touched her neck and she moaned. I was shocked at first, but quickly relieved. She was slowly coming too. The pain must have been hitting her. She began moaning much louder. I started talking to her softly. When her eyes opened, she began yelling and crying. I heard Doug walk up behind me. What is going on? Is she okay? Without even looking, I told him to call 911. I could hear him dialing behind me. I tried to calm her down. I reassured her that I was there to help. The yelling stopped, but she continued weeping and out of nowhere, she quietly whispered, Did he violate me? I hadn't thought about this until she mentioned it. The doing up of the pants finally clicked. I looked down and saw that her skirt had been lifted up and her underwear had been torn off. I hesitated, unsure of what to say. I must have said, uh, too many times, confused, and her quiet weeping broke out into a loud wailing. I felt so sad for her. I almost broke out into sobs myself, but I stayed my emotions. The last thing she needed in her present state was another bawling woman. I fought the urge to push her skirt down. I knew if I was in her position, I wouldn't want a bunch of strangers ogling at my crotch, and instead, I took off my apron and placed it over her. I hoped it wouldn't corrupt any evidence, and I heard Doug talking behind me and became afraid his presence may cause her to freak out. I stood up real fast and asked him to step back. He didn't argue. As we waited for the ambulance, I helped her hand and tried to reassure her. When they arrived, I took one paramedic aside and gave her a quick synopsis of the situation. She thanked me and joined her colleague in placing the poor girl on the stretcher. The police arrived soon after. I was speaking to them when the ambulance took her away. The news must have gotten back to the rest of the staff. My boss joined me in the kitchen where I was giving an officer my statement. I thought she may have been irked because I'd been gone for so long, but she wasn't. She was very supportive, in fact. When the police were done with me, she offered to let me off for the rest of the night, but I declined. I appreciated the thought, however, I figured work would be the best thing to do to get my mind off of what I'd just seen. After that shift and for many after, I had Doug or another guy walk me to my car. I hadn't thought of the possible danger to myself until my boss mentioned it. I did think about visiting her that night, but after a lot of consideration I chose not to. 
I don't know if I'd want a complete stranger visiting me after I'd been assaulted in that way. I'd done my part in getting her help, so I'd step back and let the doctors and nurses do theirs. The days following would be consumed by work and school. Several weeks passed, and I almost put that horrible scene on my mind, albeit I'd truly never forget. Life was nearly back to normal, and I was looking forward to the school year ending. Then on a Wednesday evening, one of our ladies' nights, a bar back came into the kitchen where I was cutting limes. He told me that a group of women were asking about me. I thought that it may have been some girls from school, but when I walked out, I didn't recognize anyone. I stepped farther out into the seating area and heard my boss's voice say, There she is. That's her. I turned in the direction of her voice and saw three women standing with her. I didn't recognize any of them, but I didn't want to be rude, so I approached them. As I got closer, one of the women seemed strangely familiar, but I wasn't sure why. Can I do something for you ladies? I didn't think you'd recognize me. It was really dark that night, and I wasn't looking my best. I was certain I knew her, but her face just wasn't clicking. She must have recognized this and introduced herself. I'm Catherine. And these are my friends. I wanted them to meet the girl who saved my life. I also wanted to come see you in person and tell you how grateful I am for you to help me that night. I was helpless, and if you hadn't shown up, he may have killed me. It all fell into place. The scar on her lip and above her eyes should have tipped me off. Oh my god, I'm sorry. I feel so bad I didn't recognize you. How are you doing? I lunged forward and held her like a vice. She hugged me back, but I realized I was being a little rough and let her go. I met her two friends and they thanked me individually for helping her. We discussed her stay in the hospital. She said that they held her for three days, but it took at least two more weeks for the soreness to go away. I was doing my best not to mention the wrong thing or sound nosy, but... I figured I'd be safe asking if the police had a suspect. I could have never guessed at her answer. I know exactly who he is. I mean, I don't know his name, but he'd approached me earlier that night and asked if he could buy me a drink. I probably could have been nicer to him. I blurted out that he was a loser and no way was I dealing with him and started even laughing in his face. I only had one drink that entire night so there really was no excuse for my behavior. Like I said, I could have been nicer. He had two friends standing behind him and they laughed too. I didn't notice, but my friend said he turned bright red and gritted his teeth. He turned around and stormed off, and after that, I didn't think about him for the rest of the night. Finally, at around ten, I got bored and decided to leave. My car wasn't parked that far away, so I wasn't worried. I was walking toward it, and that same guy stepped out from the alley. He didn't say a word. He just stood there and glared at me. I said, what? And he punched me in the face. It knocked me out completely. I woke up on the ground, and he was still hitting me. I remember being dragged for a few seconds. Then I woke up again when he was on top of me. He punched me again and I passed out. Then the next thing I remember was waking up and seeing you. There's just little bits and pieces after that, but I wish I could forget the whole thing. I wasn't sure what to say after that. It was such a terrible story and I respected her for being able to talk about it. I thought for a moment and... Remember the part Doug played that night? He was working, so I asked someone to go get him. He emerged a minute later. I waved him over to us and introduced him to Catherine and her two friends. The five of us sat and spoke for around ten minutes. Catherine and I traded numbers, and we both promised to keep in touch. As I watched her walk out that evening, I prayed for the power to be as strong as a woman as her, while in the midst of such a tragic episode. Catherine and I did stay in touch for a while as my time in town drew to a close, 
I discovered that her attacker had been arrested. I called to make sure she knew, but the number no longer worked. I was disappointed and hoped that she'd contact me, but she never did. I also called the detective assigned to the case. I needed to know when I'd have to return to testify. I was happy to hear her attacker had taken a plea. He'd be off the streets for 15 years at least. I inquired about Catherine while I had him on the line. He read a message she'd sent not long after the sentencing saying, Thank you all for everything you've done for me, and it's time to start over. It was all I needed to hear. I couldn't have been happier for her. I hope she's doing well, wherever she is. I wanted to know I still think of her every day. Her strength has never ceased to be an inspiration for me. I hope the new beginning she sought has become a reality and the scars she once bore have long since faded. Until I graduated, I worked mainly temp jobs. I didn't get my first real one until the week after. An advertisement in the wanted ads said that a restaurant and bar was looking for staff. When I inquired, I discovered I couldn't wait tables until I was 21. I thanked them and was about to leave when the manager mentioned that they were also looking for a hostess. You weren't required to be 21 to do that job, and my hopes were rekindled. The manager led me to a table and we discussed the job. After an hour of asking questions, she hired me on the spot. My first shift was the next evening. For the first four years, I worked all the hours I could get, sometimes even taking morning dishwasher shifts. As my 21st birthday approached, the anticipation increased. The week leading up to it, I began training to wait tables and tend the bar. When the day came, I was ready. I worked the lunch shift 10 days straight before I worked my first shift tending bar. The following two years saw me doing much the same. Then one morning, my manager asked to speak to me. I was terrified I was being fired. Instead, she told me that the night manager was leaving. If I wanted her job, it was mine. It would mean more money for me and my daughter, but it would also come with a lot more responsibility. I had to think about it. After a restless night's sleep, I took the job and was named the new night shift manager. I had a lot to learn and the next two weeks were a big blur. Although I'd worked at night before, I still felt somewhat out of place. I was fortunate to have an amazing staff to help me through any little hiccup I had. Bethany quickly became my favorite of them. She had the most bubbly personality of anyone I'd ever met. She got on some people's nerves sometimes, but I loved her. And the customers did too. She made out well on nights she waited tables, but anytime she tended bar, the place was packed. I had her in mind to replace me if I was to ever move up, but circumstances wouldn't allow that to happen. The spring of 2007 was the wettest I'd ever seen. April through May was probably the worst. The day of the 17th, I'd been behind all day it seemed. Under normal circumstances, I would have made it to work early. Unfortunately, the rain had caused several accidents on the highway and I was running super late. Around 5.20pm, I had made it within a mile of the bar. The street came to a standstill. I stepped out to take a look. Very close to where the bar should have been, I saw multiple sets of flashing lights. I figured it was just another wreck and prepared for a long wait. Fortunately, the police soon began directing traffic and we started moving. When I reached the next intersection, I took a right and then a left onto the next street. About 5.35, I finally parked and entered through the back entrance. I was surprised not to see anyone in the kitchen. Normally, the restaurant would be beginning the evening rush. Stepping out into the dining area, I was struck by an uncomfortable quiet. The place should have been noisy and active. As I turned the corner, I saw something I'll never forget. In the middle of our dining area sat a gray mid-sized SUV. A handful of firemen and paramedics were digging through the rubble. No one even noticed me at first. For several minutes I stood frozen, taking in the utter destruction around me. At the front of the building where a big picture window once stood was a truck-sized hole. I could see several employees standing outside, a few crying and holding one another. 
I'm not sure how long it took before I was noticed by one of the service personnel. He asked who I was, and I told him. Then I asked what had happened. He identified himself as a supervisor and asked me to join him in the kitchen. He did his best to give me a brief but thorough assessment of what had occurred and informed me that the store owner and manager were on their way to the bar. His description of the events made me shudder. From eyewitness descriptions, just before 5.10pm, a car came flying through the front of the building, finally coming to rest in the middle of the dining room. The driver, who had only minor injuries, stated that her SUV hydroplaned through the red light directly in front of the bar and crashed into the building. As it stood, several patrons had been injured, but none seriously. Unfortunately, two other patrons and one employee were still missing. When he told me the employee's name, my stomach dropped to the floor. While the search was underway, I did my best to calm everyone out front. Once the bosses arrived, I let them talk to the emergency services. My place was with the staff, but my heart was buried somewhere inside. Most of us were eventually allowed to leave, but myself and a couple of others stayed behind to await news on those still missing. As dark approached, the bodies were carried out, one after another until just one remained. Just before seven, the last emerged and all hope that our sweet Bethany had survived was snuffed out. The following months were the darkest of my life. Not only had the world been robbed of the most special human I knew, the future of the bar was unknown. Fortunately, the owners decided to rebuild and about four months later, we were having our grand reopening. That evening, just before the doors were opened, a short ceremony was held to remember the victims of the crash. I was lucky enough to be the one chosen to hold Bethany's photo. Later that night, the photo was hung in a place of honor on the back wall of the bar. I loved the idea of her always being there with us and I'm sure she would have been overjoyed to be remembered in such a loving way. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Be sure to click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. If you got a story, submit them to my subreddit at r slash let's read official and give and receive feedback from the community and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And be sure to join a live stream so you can get an invite to my Discord where you can interact with me and other listeners directly. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations for just $1 a month on Patreon, and maybe even pick up some Let's Read merch on Spreadshirt. And check out the Let's Read podcast, where you can hear all these stories in long compilation form and save huge on data, located anywhere you listen to podcasts. All links down below. Thanks so much, friends, and I'll see you again soon.